Hi, this is Jose Figueroa with an Approved Workman, where we are rightly dividing the word of truth. Welcome to another week of Bible study. I am so glad you're here as we open up God's word one more time. Our current series is Living Hope, a study of the book of 1 Peter. If you're new to this Bible teaching ministry, here's how you can learn more about it. First, go to our website, www.anapprovedworkman.org. That's anapprovedworkman.org. On the website, you can learn more about the purpose of this ministry, our approach to Bible study, and also review our statement of faith. You can subscribe to the podcast. Uh, which is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or Amazon Music, as well as other podcast directories. On the website also, you can listen to previous episodes of our current series on First Peter or any episodes from our previous Bible study series. If you are on social media, you can connect with an approved workman there too. I'm on Instagram at an approved workman. Our Pinterest profile is pinterest.com slash an approved workman. And our Facebook page is facebook.com slash inapprovedworkman215. Finally, if you're watching the video version of this lesson, make sure you subscribe to our channel on either YouTube or Rumble to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes. Today, we're in lesson number three in the series Living Hope from the book of First Peter. This study is part one of our series, Strangers and Pilgrims, which covers First and Second Peter. The lesson for today is titled, Living Stones, part one, and our focus passage is First Peter chapter two, verses one through 10. So please find your way in your Bible to that passage. In this chapter, Peter calls believers to act as living stones that proclaim God's excellence. What makes a place a destination for travelers? Surely you have a list of locations you need to visit before your time on this earth is finished. Maybe it is a place of incredible beauty that can only be experienced in person. Or, it could be a place where you get to do something that can only be accomplished at that location. Maybe it's a place rich with history and traveling there can take you back in time. It might just be a great place to have just a, a fun, relaxing time. But what about a location that's famous just for stones? For example, Stonehenge. Is a prehistoric monument on Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire, England, two miles west of Amesbury. It consists of an outer ring of vertical sarsen standing stones, each around 13 feet high, 7 feet wide, and weighing around 25 tons, topped by connecting horizontal lintel stones. Archaeologists believe that Stonehenge was constructed from around 3000 BC to 2000 BC. The surrounding circular earth bank and ditch, which constitute the earliest phase of the monument, have been dated to about 3100 BC. Here's another example. The Mount Rushmore National Memorial, which is a national memorial centered on a colossal sculpture carved into the granite face of Mount Rushmore in the Black Hills near Keystone, South Dakota in the United States. The sculpture features the 60 foot tall heads of four United States presidents, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, and Abraham Lincoln. Mount Rushmore attracts more than 2 million visitors annually. The four presidents were chosen to represent the nation's birth, growth, development, and preservation, respectively. So these are just two examples of locations where many people take a trip 
just to go see them, just to go see these stones, these stone monuments. And the reason that you, could, that you can do that is this. These are inert, inactive stone monuments. It's not like these are living stones that can move. They're not going anywhere or do anything. In our previous episode, we concluded our study of 1 Peter chapter 1. In this chapter, Peter exhorts believers to live in a way that reflects their great redemption and living hope. As believers, we should always remember that because we have been saved by Jesus Christ, we have the great responsibility of living in a way that demonstrates our great redemption and our living hope. Let's review now the principles and applications from our teaching from 1 Peter chapter 1. In our first division, our great redemption from verses 1 to 12, we learn this principle. God's elect live with confidence in their Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. God's elect live with confidence in their Savior and Redeemer, Jesus Christ. As a way of application, we ask this question. How are you comforted knowing your inheritance in heaven is secure? And how does your life show you understand the living hope that is yours in Christ? Our second division from 1 Peter chapter 1 was our great responsibility, verses 13 through 25. Our principle, God's elect live reflecting their great Redeemer and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's elect live reflecting their great Redeemer and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our application was this. How does your life reflect that you now belong to Jesus Christ and that you have been redeemed by Him? If you missed that previous episode, I encourage you to either listen to the podcast or watch the video of that lesson. In today's lesson, we begin our study of 1 Peter chapter 2. In contrast with our inert, dead, monumental stones, Peter is going to refer to his audience, to Christians, as living stones. He is also going to refer to Christ as the choice living stone. What does he mean by that? And what are the implications for our lives? Before we jump into the study of the passage, Let's hear from Dr. N.T. Wright as he provides us with a great context for this chapter. He says, quote, For gardeners, stones are simply a nuisance. They get in the way. But for a first century Jew who knew the scriptures, the very word stone carried a double promise. First, the great hope of Israel was that the true God, Yahweh, would return to Zion, to Jerusalem at last, coming back to live forever in the temple, once it had been properly rebuilt as a suitable residence for him. There was a long tradition of speaking about the temple being built on the rock, on the cornerstone. Second, the word stone in ancient Hebrew is very like the word for sun. Just as our word sun has three out of the five letters of stone, so the Hebrew word for sun, ben, has three out of the four letters for the word for stone, eben. Dr. Wright continues, How do the stone and the sun join up? In a famous biblical promise, much quoted in Jesus' day, God promised David that his son would build a temple in Jerusalem and that this son of David would actually be the son of God himself. 2 Samuel 7 verses 12 through 14. The way some people, including the early Christians, were reading the prophecies of Isaiah, the chosen precious cornerstone was no longer a physical stone itself, but a human being the coming king, upon whom Israel's God would build something new. End quote. And again, that's Dr. N.T. Wright in his Everyone Bible Study Guides on First and Second Peter and Jude. 
Here's our lesson outline and goal for our teaching from 1 Peter chapter 2. Again, the lesson is Living Stones. We're looking at part one. We have three divisions from 1 Peter chapter 2. First, elect stones, verses 1 through 10. Then, excellent stones, verses 11 to 20. And our third and final division, enduring stones, verses 21 through 25. Our goal for the teaching from 1 Peter chapter 2 is this, to encourage believers to remember that as God's chosen people, our lives should bring praise, honor, and glory to Him. Again, the goal for the teaching from 1 Peter chapter 2 is this, to encourage believers to remember that as God's chosen people, our lives should bring praise, honor, and glory to Him. Today we will focus on that first division, Elect stones, verses 1 through 10. Let's get started. Let's go to that first division from 1 Peter chapter 2. Elect stones, verses 1 through 10. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Unlike newborn babies, Long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by people, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, For this is contained in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will not be put to shame. This precious value, then, is for you who believe, but for unbelievers, a stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. As we start with verse 1, we see that in light of everything Peter has said to this point, what we cover in chapter 1, regarding our great redemption and our living hope, he calls on his audience to completely rid themselves of five things in their lives. The phrase has the idea of taking off an old, useless garment. So he's basically telling them what not to wear in this new life of them. So let's go through the list and properly define these attributes that should no longer be part of our everyday lives as Christians. And this comes from the Bible sense lexicon. First, malice is defined as depravity or perversion. It is the perverting of virtue and moral principles from their purposes to evil ends. So you have these virtues, these moral principles, and then get they get uh, corrupted, perverted, because you want to go in a different direction, you want you have an evil end in mind. Second, deceit or craftiness is the shrewdness as demonstrated by being skilled in deception. Just to give you some context, Satan himself is called the great deceiver. He's shrewd, he's crafty, he's looking not always at schemes. So again, you see the identification with, with the prince of of this world, Satan. Number three, hypocrisy uh, is the idea of acting, is insincerity by virtue of pretending to have qualities or beliefs 
that you do not really have. And it goes well with deceit because if you're uh, you're trying to be sure, you're trying to deceive people, one of the things you have to do is kind of keep the act, the pretension as long as you can. And that's where hypocrisy comes in. Again, you have an evil end in mind. That's where the malice is. It's the foundation of everything. You're going to utilize deceit uh, to deceive people, to, to con them. And then you have to keep up the act uh, of the hypocrite, right? Pretending to be something you're not. Number four envy. Uh, this is the idea of having spite and resentment toward the success or possessions of another. So again, you have an evil purpose in mind. You have corrupted your moral principles. So you're going to deceive people. You're going to be a hypocrite because you want something or you want to replace somebody uh, that has something you don't have. And finally, it all ends with slander. And slander is abusive words falsely spoken that damage a person's reputation. Again, uh, you're looking for an evil end. You're engaging in deceit and hypocrisy. You envy that person that has what you don't have. So because you envy them, because it turns into hate, you go ahead and try to slander that person. Uh, this morning at church, the preacher was using the story of David and Saul as a backdrop for his sermon. And I kept thinking as I was listening to the message that this is exactly how Saul behaved towards David. Saul had lost the support of the Lord. The Lord took the kingdom from him. The spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. He went and anointed David. David is going to be the next king. So Saul goes through all of this. He has evil purposes in mind. He wants to hang on to the throne. So he engaged in deceit and hypocrisy. He uses David, but he's really envious, jealous, fearful of David. He says, lies about David and ultimately he wants to kill David and chases him out of the land for a while. So the the idea, the conflict between Saul and David is a perfect picture of what we see here. And Peter says you have to lay off these things. You have to completely rid yourselves of these things in your life now that you are a Christian. The question is, how are believers to accomplish this action of completely eliminating these characteristics in our lives? I believe we get the answer in verses 2 and 3. Peter encourages Christians to have an attitude that is different. Instead of being driven by malice and all the outpouring of that malice, the deceit, the hypocrisy, the envy, the slander, uh, he calls on them to be like newborn babies who crave the pure milk of the word. Now, if you know anything about newborn babies is that they don't know much and they cannot do much. They are completely depending on their parents, especially their mothers. But one thing they clearly know how to do is ask, to demand, to be fed. When that time comes, they cry out for that milk to satisfy their hunger. And they don't stop crying until their hunger is satisfied. Peter says that as believers, we should be crying out, seeking after the one thing that can satisfy our spiritual hunger, the Word of God. It is the Word of God that nourishes the believer. And this is what is required to continue the process of the spiritual growth into our salvation. In other words, by feeding on the Word of God, we can continue advancing into our sanctification. This is how we get rid of those undesirable characteristics in Peter lists in verse 1. In his Bible commentary, Dr. Tony Evans comments on how essential this nourishment is for Christians. He says, quote, Although this new life is imperishable, it requires growth. Our sinful self-centeredness will continue to rule if we let it, unless the seed of spiritual life is nourished. The word that caused us to be born again is the same word that causes growth. But unfortunately, many Christians choose malnourishment. They need a steady diet and application of God's word instead of man's opinion. End quote.
Furthermore, Peter says that this desire to be fed by the word of God is a clear indication that they have indeed made a complete allegiance to the Lord. They have experienced true redemption and deliverance. They have tasted, experienced the goodness of the Lord in their salvation. Here, Peter is quoting from Psalm 34, verse 8. This craving for the word is clear evidence of their salvation. Here is a question for you. Do you struggle with wanting to even read your Bible? In his commentary on 1 Peter, Dr. R.C. Sproul speaks about the implications of our redemption and what should be our desires for the things of God. He says, quote, If you are not reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are not truly a Christian. And if you are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are a Christian. Whereas before, we had no inclination or desire for the things of God. God has quickened our souls and created in us a desire for Him and for His Son. No one can be brought to spiritual life without also being fundamentally changed. End quote. And again, that's Dr. R.C. Sproul from his commentary on First and Second Peter. Be all the more diligent to make your calling an election. Sure. In verse 4, Peter continues and reminds them that in their salvation, they have come to Jesus Christ himself. This Jesus Christ is the living stone who was rejected by men, but it is choice and precious in the sight of God. Peter reminds them, of the reality that Jesus is God's choice for the salvation of people, regardless of what the world thinks. In his first advent, Jesus was rejected by most people, and that is still true today. Most people will fail to be saved because they will insist in rejecting the only way provided by God Almighty for their salvation. As we read in John chapter 4, 14 verse 6 and Acts chapter 4 verses 10 through 12. In verse 5, Peter says that in contrast believers, because they have come to the living stone, they are also living stones. His very life is in them and he is building them into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. Jesus Christ is building up his elect people, his church, as he told the twelve in his response to Peter's own great declaration in Matthew 16, beginning in verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you lose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Matthew 16, 18 through 19. In his commentary on First and Second Peter, Dr. Warren Worsby provides a beautiful visual as he speaks on how each and every believer is a part of his church. This is what Dr. Worsby says, quote, Believers are living stones in his building. Each time someone trusts Christ, another stone is quarried out of the pit of sin and cemented by grace into the building. It may look to us that the church on earth is a pile of rubble and ruins, but God sees the total structure as it grows. What a privilege we have to be a part of His church and habitation of God through the Spirit. End quote. Don't you love that visual? Each time someone trusts Christ, another stone is quarried out of the pit of sin and cemented by grace into the building. Beautiful picture. Thank you, Dr. Worsby. And notice also that this is not a physical house. I mean, we're using the picture, the imagery of stones of a building, but this is not a physical house. It's a spiritual house. The church and its individual members 
are the temple, the household of God. As the Apostle Paul tells the Corinthian believers, we are God's temple, and we are to be different and separate from the world. As Dr. Michael Heiser would put it, we are sacred space. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy that person. For the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Advancing to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? For you have been bought for a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. 1 Corinthians 6, 19-20. You see the idea? We are the temple. The temple is a holy place because it's supposed to contain, to have the very presence of God in the temple. The Holy Spirit in us. We are God's temple. We are supposed to be different. We are supposed to be holy, set apart, sacred space for the Lord. Here's one more from the Apostle Paul on this idea of sacred space. 2 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 15. Or what harmony does Christ have with Belial? Or what does a believer share with a non-believer? Or what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. 2 Corinthians 6, 15 and 16. As priests of this spiritual house, believers are called to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And what form do these sacrifices take? I believe they involve prayer, service, and worship. Look at Isaiah chapter 56. Verse 7, even those I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all the peoples. Isaiah 56, 7. Romans chapter 12 Verse 1, a very uh, well-known passage. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may, you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 13, beginning in verse 15. Through him, then, let's continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips praising his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Hebrews 13, 15 through 16. Spiritual sacrifices of prayer, of service, of ministry, of doing good things, of praise and worship to God. That's what we're called to do as priests in this spiritual house. In verse 6, Peter wants to bring this back to the key point of this passage. Jesus Christ is the sure foundation of of everything for our lives. He is the one who brings our justification, our sanctification, and our future glorification. And Peter does this by quoting Old Testament scripture to establish that long ago, God promised that he would lay in Zion, in Jerusalem, a choice and precious cornerstone for the purpose of salvation. 
And for the person who puts their trust in him, they will never suffer shame. We start with Isaiah chapter 28, verse 16. Therefore, this is what the Lord God says, Behold, I am laying a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone for the foundation, firmly placed. The one who believes in it will not be disturbed. Isaiah 28, 16. In other words, you can safely put all your trust in this precious choice stone. Paul quotes the passage as well in Romans 9, 33 and Romans 10, verse 11. Peter continues in verses 7 and 8 and tells us that this chosen stone is of precious value to believers because he is the stone, the rock of salvation. When you choose to believe in him, you find life and you stand in an exalted place of honor. In contrast, for those who refuse to believe in him, the rejected stone has become the chief cornerstone and also a stone of stumbling and offense to all who do not believe in him. They are disobedient and appointed to this outcome of eternal judgment. Peter goes again back to the Old Testament, starting with Psalm 118, beginning in verse 22. A stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord. It is marvelous in our eyes. Psalms 118, 22 and 23. Isaiah 8, beginning in verse 13. It is the Lord of armies whom you are to regard as holy, and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. Then he will become a sanctuary but to both houses of Israel he will be a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and a snare and a trap for the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Isaiah 8, 13 and 14. As Simeon testified to Mary, her child was born to be the cause of the rise and fall of many in Israel. In Luke chapter 2, verse 34. And Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and as a sign to be opposed. In his Bible commentary, Dr. John MacArthur uh, tells us on, talks about how Jesus Christ is a dividing line for all mankind. He says, quote, To every human being, Christ is either the means of salvation, if they believe, or the means of judgment if they reject the gospel. He is like a stone in the road that causes a traveler to fall. Unbelief is their disobedience, since the call of the gospel to repent and believe is a command from God. These were not appointed by God to disobedience and unbelief. Rather, these were appointed to doom because of their disobedience and unbelief. Judgment on unbelief is as divinely appointed as salvation by faith. End quote. It is your decision. You have a choice to make, and Jesus is that dividing line for all humankind. Dr. D.A. Carson also speaks on how divisive Jesus Christ really is. He says, quote, we too readily overlook how fundamentally divisive Jesus Christ is, even though that point is repeatedly made not only in the New Testament, but also Old Testament prophecies concerning him. Peter here, in verses 4 through 12, insists that everyone is affected by the coming of Christ, positively or negatively, depending on whether they too are living stones or Alternatively, simply reject him or stumble over him. They will find that he crushes them. End quote. And again, that's Dr. D.A. Carson on his commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament. Christ, there is no middle ground. You're either with him or against him, and there are consequences either way. This term, 
cornerstone is very significant. Here's what we find in the Holman treasury of key Bible words. It says, the most significant stone in important buildings is the cornerstone. Usually, it is the first stone laid at a formal ceremony. Often, it is engraved with the date of the building and perhaps some other ascription honoring a person or an event. Thus, it should come as no surprise that Jesus is called the Ginoia or cornerstone of the church. And again, this comes from Eugene E. Carpenter and Philip W. Comfort uh, with an entry on the Holman Treasury of Key Bible Words, 200 Greek and 200 Hebrew words defined and explained. Jesus Christ, the cornerstone of the church. Speaking of Jesus, he used this cornerstone term to speak of himself in the parable of the wicked tenants. All three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, include this declaration. The setting for this parable was his final week of ministry in Jerusalem prior to the cross, after he had cleansed the temple and the Jewish leaders questioned him about his actions. Here's what he said. Matthew, and we're going to look at Matthew's passage, Matthew chapter 21, beginning in verse 42. Jesus said to them, Did you never read in the scriptures? A stone which the builders rejected, this has become the chief cornerstone. This came about from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing its fruit. And the one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and on whomever it falls, it will crush him. Matthew 21, 42 through 44. Jesus was speaking about the rejection of the Jewish leaders and the nation of Israel, the rejection of him as the Messiah, as the chief cornerstone, the choice and precious cornerstone said by God himself. Jesus was declaring the outcome, how he will be that stone that crushed him because of their own belief in him. In his words, Jesus brought together the passages from Isaiah 8 and Psalm 118. As we move ahead in verse 9 in 1 Peter 2, what he was saying and what Peter is affirming here is that if you refuse to believe in him, in Jesus Christ, you are appointed to fall and to be crushed. There is no middle ground. In contrast, believers, Peter tells us, are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a people for God's own possession. They are God's own household chosen by him to be his. And Peter here is quoting from multiple Old Testament passages in identifying all believers with the choosing and election of Israel. As we saw earlier in our series, one of the key passages comes from the scroll of Exodus and the covenant ceremony at Mount Sinai. Look at Exodus 19 beginning in verse 5 and see if you can spot the phrases that Peter is using here. Exodus 19, beginning in verse 5. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you should speak to the sons of Israel. Exodus 19, 5 and 6. We also see a similar idea expressed as Moses was speaking to Israel's next generation before their entrance into the promised land. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7 beginning in verse 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his personal possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord 
did not make you his beloved, nor choose you because you were greater in number than any of the peoples, since you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Deuteronomy 7, 6 through 8. Finally, the prophet Isaiah also speaks of God's choice of Israel. Isaiah 43, beginning in verse 20. The animals of the field will glorify me, the jackals and the ostriches, because I have given waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my chosen people. The people whom I form for myself will declare my praise. Isaiah 43, 20 and 21. So when Peter uses this precise language, he is doing something monumental. He is unequivocally applying all those Old Testament scriptures to the church, to the believers, to the reconstituted people of God, Jew and Gentile alike. As we have seen earlier in our study, believers are one people of God. And this is the same choice language applied to all believers in the book of Revelation, to the ones purchased by the blood of the Lamb. Look at Revelation 1, verse 6. And he made us into a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Revelation 5, beginning in verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals, for you were slaughtered, and you purchased people for God with your blood from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them into a kingdom and priest to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Revelation 1, 6 and 5, 9 and 10. This selection, this choice of God, it is not supposed to just be a passive exercise. He has a purpose, an objective in mind. The purpose of believers is to proclaim the excellencies of God who has called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. What God has done in our lives through Jesus Christ is so great that our only possible reaction is to speak about it constantly with joy and without shame. The whole world needs to know about the greatness of God and his salvation. As Paul tells the Colossians, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transfers, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1, 13 and 14. In his commentary on 1 Peter, Dr. Sproul speaks about this marvelous purpose for the people of God. He says, quote, we have received our citizenship for the purpose of proclaiming God's praises. To worship God is to offer him not an animal sacrifice or a cereal offering, but the sacrifice of praise. The praise of God should be on our lips every moment because citizens of this heavenly kingdom spend eternity praising the king of that heavenly nation, singing with the angels, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation 5, verse 12. End quote. As we have discussed before in this podcast, there is nothing casual about the worship of God in heaven as we learn in the book of Revelation. And Dr. Carson also concurs with this view of our high calling. He says, quote, The excellencies of God that Isaiah has in view are manifested in the deliverance of his people from the exile. The excellencies of God that Peter has in view are manifested in the salvation and transformation of his people, along with the hope 
that they enjoy for the consummating transformation, all of which was achieved by the ministry, death, and resurrection of God's own Son. End quote. This is again Dr. D.A. Carson on his commentary on the New Testament use of the Old Testament. Moving ahead to verse 10. Finally, in this section, Peter reminds his audience that there was a time when they were not the people of God. He uses the words of the prophet Hosea to remind them that they, at some point, they had received no mercy from him, from God. Because of this, there was a time that they were without hope. But now, they are God's people. They belong to him and have received his mercy. Look at Hosea chapter 2, verse 23. I will sow her for myself in the land. I will also have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who were not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Hosea 2.23 So what do we have? Believers are elect, living stones, and they should act accordingly to this great calling of God in their lives to bring Him praise and glory. Because they belong to Him. What does that mean to you? Well, this brings us to the end of this first division. What is our principle? God's people are elect stones living to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ, the precious cornerstone. God's people are elect stones living to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ, the precious cornerstone. So then, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Paul brings all these ideas together beautifully in Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. What is our application? How is your life proclaiming the excellencies of the one who saved you? This concludes part one of our teaching from 1 Peter chapter 2. Thank you for being here today. Next time, we will focus on our second division, Excellent Stones from verses 11 through 20, and our third division, Enduring Stones from verses 21 through 25. Until then, this is Jose Figueroa for In a Proof Workman, where we are rightly dividing the word of truth. May God richly bless you.